Hello, everyone. Good morning and welcome to Cary, North Carolina and my fourth, fourth podcast. Thank you so much for listening and joining in. And if you have the ability to be watching us on YouTube, thank you so much for watching us there. I am Eddie Ryder, and this is my podcast, Designers Lane. Uh, you can also find us, don't forget to subscribe online, www.designerslanepodcast. Find all the previous podcasts and any of the upcoming one are going to post there. Be sure and check it out and subscribe where you can. Want to give a big shout out and thanks to my two sponsors for this podcast, Jenny Blanton. She's going to handle all of your real estate needs if you're in Central North Carolina. It's going to be Cary, Raleigh, Durham area, Samford, all of that general area. She's going to be able to take really, really good care of you and give you a super experience. And we also have Dogwood and Company. Dogwood builds your beautiful home, luxury homes, primarily in the Cary area. He's also, they are also going to be able to handle your, any rem major remodeling that you have, anything that's going to be beautiful and nice. Be sure and give them a call if you have any upcoming projects. Last episode three, Kind of cut out a little bit quick. We're going to circle back on a couple of elements, but one of the big things I wasn't able to talk about, which is coming on strong in my particular area that I'm based in right now and likely in the area that you are currently in and residing or potentially building, is this whole big issue with pervious and impervious material. Pervious and impervious materials. I can't stress how important this is. It basically deals with the amount of water that you are in charge of on your lot, on your project. Let's start off with some definitions in case you didn't know um, and need a better understanding. Pervious basically means water is going to go through it. Um, great example uh, is your yard, your garden. Anything with dirt, water physically has to rain down, dribble on it, and suck it into the earth. It can't wash off. It can't run off. Uh, it needs to go down. Part of the new rules and regulations are requiring you to have more and greater pervious areas in your build. You're not able to have a small section of non-runoff material, you have to have larger. So when you're designing your plan in the very, very beginning, you need to know what percentage of pervious and impervious materials you have to have. Impervious, you're asking, what in the heck is that? Well, impervious is actually the challenge that we have. That is the material that does not allow any drainage or any water to go through. And those are the big elements that's on your project. That's your roof, which is the biggest cover on your lot. It is your driveway, which could easily be the second largest cover on your project. It's your walkway. It's anywhere that you walk. It could be your patio. It could be the surrounding of your pool. If you have a greenhouse, if you have a garden shed, again, impervious. Any material that deflects water or does not allow it to drain through, huge, huge, huge. There are guidelines in whatever town or whatever city where you live that will stipulate and call out what those requirements are. It could be as low as eight and a half or nine percent of the total lot can only be impervious materials. So if you have a half acre lot or three quarter acre lot, depending on the restrictions, you could only be allowed to have 8, 9, 10% of your construction project to not drain. That is a small number. Uh, now, if you have a larger lot or you have some area to the side, that may change. 
eight percent is a little small. Don't want to freak anybody out. Currently, it's averaging 12, 13, 18, 22. But again, if you think about you can only have impervious materials on 25% of your lot, that's a quarter of your total area. Can't stress enough how important this is on the very beginning of your project. I'd like to call it the front end to know what the rules are in your neighborhood or your city. You may have built a project in North Carolina or California or Florida. Heck, you could have even built something at the coast of North Carolina. Those restrictions are not going to be the same or those guidelines are not going to be the same in that same area as, say, central North Carolina. If you have retention ponds in your neighborhood, if you have a newer neighborhood, the guidelines are also going to be different. You're going to have a little bit larger space that you're able to build. Again, I can't stress enough. You need to know what the guidelines are in the community that you're building or remodeling. Make sure you follow those rules because if you don't, the state or the city could come back and force you to meet those rules and those regulations. Really, really big deal. Running into that on a couple of projects now. Had them in other communities, so I was aware of them and fall into their categories and have an understanding. However, right now in Cary, where I'm Cary, North Carolina, where I'm doing your free projects, they're definitely paying attention to it. So you want to follow the rules, make sure you're in those guidelines, and I think that you will be okay. We ran out a little bit of time on tile at the last episode, number three. Wanted just to quickly touch base on that. Make sure when you're picking out your tile, you understand the scale, the size, the format. Right now, we're using a lot of 12 by 24 tiles instead of the 12 by 12. There's also these beautiful larger format tiles. Consider them in your primary shower or as an accent area. You can do the super duper large ones and even use them on your fireplace if you're going for a more modern style. Lots of options out there, plan enough time to make that happen. And also, you know, that B word budget, make sure you have a really strong, reasonable number to put that in there. When you go to the tile shop, usually about a week or two weeks later, either your designer or your person that you met with at the tile store, is going to give you a drawing and it's physically going to have everything laid out. It's going to have it called out, labeled what goes where. It's also going to have show your patterns that you have on the floor. Look at those, make sure they're the right direction. When it comes to the floor, I'm a big fan of having the the lines of the grout run parallel with the face of your cabinet, say if it's in your bathroom um, or if it's in a bar area where you have tile, I call it the railway tracks. I like them to line up with the face of the cabinet. That is a great way to look at it. Um, You certainly don't have to do that. There's no right and wrong. To me, it opens up the space a little bit um, greater and gives you a little bit more visual. The other thing to consider is how you want the joints. Do you want them staggered? Do you want them third? Do you want them straight laid? Have all of that called out, all of that documented. So when that happens and that vendor starts to lay the tile or the vendor prices it out to make sure he's in line with what the budget is, he has a really good understanding. Not every pattern is going to cost you the same thing. These beautiful, small mosaic tiles, they cost a little bit more to lay down, probably a buck to $2 a square foot, sometimes three or four if it's a natural material. If you have a larger pattern tile, that could cost a couple more dollars a square foot to install. Again, your builder if is giving you a budget on the front side. If he's not aware of that and we don't know what's selected, they have a difficult time pricing that out. So when you go to your selections and you have your inspirational pictures, have that all figured out and laid out. Also have the ability to maybe juggle that a little bit if you need to, need to save a few dollars. Maybe in the secondary bathrooms, the kids' bathrooms or the grandkids' bathrooms, 
you do a simpler tile, you do a straight pattern, save a few bucks, put that extra money towards your lighting fixtures, put it towards your countertops, put it towards something else. It will all work out and be beautiful. One other element to remember, our delivery time is on tile, just like it seems everything else in the construction is taking a little bit longer. Not as bad and crazy as other elements, but what we are seeing is uh, discontinued tiles. Um, we call it discoed. Uh, always, if there's something that you love, you may consider go ahead, order it. Very, very beginning of the project, sit on it or be very prepared to change your tile, change your mind. If that particular item gets discontinued, you have to change something. Remember, you're likely going to be looking at tile five, six, seven months, eight months before you need it. So there's a slight chance that's going to be discontinued. Never hurts to ask that vendor, to ask the person that you're meeting with, what's the likelihood that's going to be discontinued? What is stock and availability? I love Florida Tile, meet with them, use them often. They pull up, can pull up and tell you how new is the tile? How old is the tile? What is the inventory? And often they have a really good idea if that's going to be discontinued. If you don't love it and it's something you, you could live without and there's a chance it's going to be discontinued, I would go ahead and pick out something else or have your backup, your standby very, very close. And then again, grout has come amazing. It has come up to the 21st, 22nd, 23rd century. It's a lot easier to put it in. You can call out your grout joints. You can either do them really, really narrow or a little bit wider, but don't be afraid of white, the lighter colors. Just don't use bleach. Don't use Clorox on them, but they're much, much easier to clean. Some of them have an epoxy base, so you're absolutely fantastic and absolutely great to use those. Definitely take all of that into consideration. Now, I take my tile with me, the small samples, to the countertop places. Um, there are distributors, which is where I often go to. They're going to have a gazillion slabs either outside or inside of their warehouse. I find it's a heck of a lot easier to take samples with me in a bag in my car to the vendors actually to the granite yards or the countertop fabricators and look at those materials with the actual slabs. Some of the pictures in episode three, you saw that how I had the tile that's physically with me. I either carry it around in a bag or push it around in a car and you can see how it plays. You know, is it too much texture on the countertop, too much texture on the tile? You can see how they work. These distributors, which are where you're going to go, one, are typically not going to give you a price. They'll color code it, and one of the pictures you'll be able to see are many of the pictures where you see the slabs. There's a color dot that is up in the top, and we can actually start looking at some of the pictures now. So this first particular picture, you at the, the top right of the slabs, you start seeing a color dot. The uh, picture that's, or the slab that's closest to us, that actually has a green dot. And I, I sort of like to use the elements of a stoplight. Typically green is good, blue is good, yellow, anything that has a yellowish color dot means slow down, it's getting to be a little bit more expensive. And then when you have red dots, not the most expensive, but it's getting on up there, you know, time to stop, you know, slam on the brakes. And then you have blacks or double blacks, which are exotics, which means they come from the moon. So they're going to be the absolute most expensive, but often the prettiest to look at. So keep that in mind when you go through. Uh, another reason to have a strong number, strong allowance, you want something beautiful that you love in your kitchen and most often in your primary bathroom, your master suite, but your secondary spaces, you can either do remnants or you can do a little bit more cost effective materials, but it is easier to take the tile with you and push it around a cart or drag it in a bag in these warehouses than it is to take this thousand pound slab and sling it on the top of your car and take it back to the tile store or the tile vendor. Not fun, not healthy. And often they don't have samples of the countertop. And if they do, they're so small, you can't see all of the pattern and the rhythm that's there. This, believe it or not, is a, actually it's not a porcelain, this is still a ceramic tile. This is, the tile is on the bottom 
And then the countertop material that I am using you know, for the countertop, this is going to go in a bathroom, blends so incredibly well. Uh, this is a polished, so you can see the light reflecting in the top of it. It is not matte. It is not honed. It is not a leather finish. It's going to have a polish to it. And in my mind, absolutely beautiful. I call this, this has a, a linear motion to it. It definitely has a visual texture. It doesn't have an actual texture, but you can look at it. Ties in almost immaculate with the floor tile. The Particular, this particular client did not want a lot going on in their bathroom. They wanted it a little bit more seamless, a little bit uh, sharp. I'd call it clean. This element works lovely with it. You can kind of see off to the left, this has a yellow dot. So when we were there with the client, kind of telling them this is not going to be a standard countertop material. It's up there. Uh, this works very, very well in smaller spaces because it's linear. Uh if you have big patterns and big textures, you don't want to use that in small spaces because you're not able to see the colors. But this is absolutely beautiful, very gray, very clean lines, and simple and absolutely fabulous. This is a porcelain, if you can believe it. This is our, our friends at Francini. Um, this is a little bit warmer, has a couple of tones, and it grays and some golds. And at the very, very bottom, again, you can see where I brought my tile samples with me that you can see it. And I have my little sticker, my little post-it on there that tells me where it will be installed, gives me a nice reminder. Beautiful, beautiful top. And remember, porcelains are magnificent right now. You can do them in large format. Uh, they're printed. They're not a natural material, but they do such an incredible job printing them that you look at that, like you look at that particular mirror and you're like, holy cow, I can't believe that's not a natural material. So don't take that out of the mix. Always consider porcelain to be an option for you when you're choosing your countertops um, in larger formats. This represents a tile. I'm not quite sure how I got this in there, but we'll talk about it. It's a beautiful tile. Um, I actually use this in a laundry room. Uh, this is a pattern or a graphic you put four of them together. It's going to make a diamond pattern, a larger diamond pattern. And this particular element, I used a, uh, the cabinet color was a soft white, very, very similar to the, the bone color that's in here. And the countertop material, I did a quartz. Um, I played with that gray, that that medium colored gray, I believe it was called Cityscape, and it came out lovely. Really, really nice. Definitely consider when you're picking out your tiles to use a graphic. Timeless and will be around forever. This happened in a laundry room and was absolutely beautiful. This particular material, I jumped from uh, Raleigh, um, Wilson area down to Wilmington. Uh, this was a remnant that I found it, uh, and a remnant is often a smaller, uh, leftover material from a larger job that someone else did. And sometimes you can get a really good deal if they will sell you the remnants. Often the remnants are not available. This tile um, represents the tile that I have in the shower. Um, this particular bathroom had a, it was an older house or a more of a historical element, it had a beautiful wood floor. So I only had this tile in the shower. Lucked out, how amazing do the colors play and the colors work on this countertop material. This is a quartzite material with that tile. A little bit of blue, a little bit of green, a little bit of warm grays, a little bit of soft whites. I felt like, oh my gosh, I can't go wrong regardless if the tile lands in one of those colors. But this shows where having that sample of the tile is a really big deal and not a photograph or going with your memory. And again, you can see my notes. That is bathroom number four that that's happening so I don't forget. And again, when you're reflecting and seeing what happens and what is installed in every room, you get to flash back and see what that color is. Beautiful, beautiful. Still down in Wilmington, uh, this particular material is a quartz. It's a man-made material. It has the speckles in it. And this went in two applications. You can see some of my shower tiles, which is on the far left. And on the far right, there's another pattern or a graphic tile. Remember, it takes four of those tiles to complete the pattern. 
And this application, I brought the stain of the cabinet. Uh, this is a whitewash um, and a blend. Uh, this was made from a fabulous company down in Wilmington. We custom made the cabinets. Again, wanted to go light and airy because it was the coast. And I love the idea of the the, the dots and the flex, the texture that this top um, made. It pulled from the applications, and I was able to use it in two different spaces. But yet, when you're there, it looks completely different. This is actually a great price point material, believe it or not. So don't always think you have to spend the most money in certain areas, go for the look, go what's beautiful, and this certainly is beautiful and landed out amazingly. Even the gravel on the bottom of the um, uh, pavement shows it. This slide actually shows, this is the small sample of that big slab that we just looked at. And again, I'm now inside. You can see it laid with, you know, the medium brown cabinets. I was trying to decide, does it work with the, you know, the darker gray, the medium gray cabinet, or should I go with the stain, the whitewash, the ceruzed look? Then I have that blue tile. I have that pattern tile. You can see how everything flows together. Have my Again, I've say it a thousand times, all little post-its that tell me what goes where. You can physically see how everything um, just blends. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And this is a fabulous picture of our friends at Francini. They've recently moved um, from Raleigh. I believe that they're in over near the Zebulon area, right on the border of Raleigh. When you go to any of your uh, distributors, and that's what this is, it's not a fabricator, it's a distributor. You know, if you go on a hot day, make sure you wear shorts and a tank top because it's warm. The, the, the back area, it's in a big, huge warehouse, is not conditioned, and it's going to be warm. Uh, and I also encourage you not to wear flip-flops, open-toe shoes, because when you walk through the slabs, you're going to have big, huge slabs. I mean, huge, full slabs the size of your island that you're going to go through. And then often there's blocks of wood that hold them up. And if you stump your toe, if you have an open-toe shoe or a flip-flop, it does not feel good to so make sure you wear close toe shoes. This gives you a great example of what it's going to look like when you go visit. Uh, typically, you don't need an appointment to go. I would highly recommend going either with your fabricator or going with your builder or your designer. Bring your samples with you so you definitely know what the heck you're looking at. And you don't have to go back three or four times to make your reselections and also be ready to pay for your slabs. They are not going to hold your slabs forever. And your fabricator is not going to hold your slabs forever once you make your decision. Those of you who don't know the difference between the two, distributors actually who the fabricator buys the material from, fabricator is going to fabricate it. They're going to cut it. They're going to install it. They're going to make it look beautiful. You're going to pay the fabricator. But the fabricator also has the pay to the distributor. So when you make those decisions, you'll be able to see it. This picture is a fabulous example of what a slab is. They can be 115, 17 inches wide, 77, 87, 90 inches tall. Huge. This also shows my little cart where I drag around the tile. I promise you that tile is not pink. It's coming off a little pink in the pictures. But it's nice to be able to see the elements and then how they work together. Again, your tile, your countertop material, you're able to see it. Beautiful. I believe this was Thunder White Tile on a project down in uh, Carolina Beach. Another magnificent find. And again, you see those things on the bottom, the pieces of wood that hold them. When you kick them in an open toe shoe, it hurts. It really, really hurts. Another beautiful slab. Remember the picture a couple ago where I had the blue tile or sort of the blue-green aqua tile, had the gravel and the dirt below it? This is the exact same run, the exact same slab, but a full selection. I think this looks amazing in large formats. When you have it on the island, when you have a larger top, you're able to see the veining, the movement. You know, a lot of people in the trade will call it movement. Stunning. Beautiful, beautiful. And this is, again, linear, mostly. It's going to go from side to side. You have a couple of chunks in the middle. You can play with aquas. You can play with blue-greens with this. I wouldn't do a white-white cabinet with it, more of a soft white. 
magnificent with gray. Again, larger slab. And often these materials you can book match or they'll mirror image. Um, this isn't really a great example, but book match and mirror image is where they slice the, the granite and the slabs. You can put the two together and the veining and the image of the material carries all the way through. Fabulous in your countertop. So if you have a really, really large countertop and you have to seam them and put them in there, probably put it right there, get away from Charlie. Great way to be able to do it. Something always to consider when you do that is do you need one slab? Do you need two? Talking about slab size, your island, if you do not want a seam, it is critical to know the size of the slab that you're working with and convey that to your cabinet maker. I've been in the industry long enough to know generally what slabs are going to be or what needs to go into the island. If you absolutely cannot have seams in your countertop, you need to work within the guidelines of what the material is actually going to be and happen. So keep that in mind. Wanted to point out a couple of things in this, and this is also in my background picture, is talk about tops and talk about cabinets. This countertop is Artemis. This is what's called a mitered. It's a thicker edge detail. So this is about three inches. So you can see how this runs thick veining. Again, you have to take the full width of the island, add probably five inches to each side of it, and also the depth of it, to, again, to make sure that you have enough a countertop, and then carry the exact same countertop to the left and right of the range. Did not do it as thick, just use the regular thickness of the, the countertop material, which is, this is a quartz side, and it's usually right around three centimeters. And one thing, not countertops, I do want to point out with this, this particular cabinet layout and kitchen is how the lights and the countertop and the hardware, hardware is a little bit darker gray, it's not quite black, all ties in so nicely with the, the countertops, the stainless steel refrigerator. These appliances actually, we spit, split. You have the refrigeration on the right and then the freezer on the left, but beautiful format and Beautiful, beautiful, gorgeous. I hope you enjoyed those pictures. Very, very nice. Let's talk about lot and let's talk about plot plan and setbacks. This picture you're seeing is a typical plot plan and what is submitted to the town, what the architect and the surveyor works off of. Big line all the way around it represents your property line. The dashed lines, and you can see on this one, it says 15 feet, is your setbacks. That is what you need to build. We also call it your building envelope. That's what your, anything with a roof needs to physically be in that space. This particular project architect, we stopped it probably six inches from the setbacks because the roof is going to overhang and you really don't want the roof. That's what you're going to go by. And then your roof could either be, you know, two or three inches or it could be two feet. Take that into consideration when you plan it. The bottom of the slide represents the driveway and then you have the pool and then the surrounding of the pool. This doesn't have a really big decking. It's very clean. And then also on the top left, this represents the cabana. You have the dimensions and the size in there. And you also show the plans, the distance from the rear of the lot to your building envelope or to your rear setback. And then the same thing with the front. Other element, which we talked about at the beginning, is the pervious and the non-pervious material. This gives you a really good opportunity to look at it and see, okay, how much of this material is not going to drain, is going to be impervious material, and do I need to make adjustments and any changes in this process or in this layout? One of the things that you can easily change and flip a little bit is the driveway, which is your um, impervious material. You can make it look a little bit smaller, but I often call out this, um, your building envelope and wanted to show you what that is. And also when you're physically looking at it and you're designing your plans, you have a really, really good understanding of how that's going to be. The next picture that we're going to put up is going to talk about your floor heights. Uh, this is a section elevation. The best way to explain it is imagine a loaf of bread and you slice it. This is one of the slices. 
It starts at the bottom where you can see rec room. That's pretty much the basement. You show your trusses, then you show your first floor, and then you so show your second floor. What I really wanted to focus in was on the far right, you have your ceiling heights. You have the height of the basement, the height of your first floor, and then the height of your second floor. This is a big deal to have an understanding of what you're getting and what you want. Um, what you want, let the architect know on the front side that, hey, I want 10-foot ceilings. I want 11-foot ceilings. I want 14-foot ceilings. Again, remember, there's rules and regulations of the height in the area that you build. So you can't have, you know, 14 feet on every single floor, but you may be able to have it on one or two floors. This shows you what happens and what works. And then again, the, the far right will show you what the ceiling height is. They call it top of plate. There's a couple of inches that that takes, but it gives you a really good idea and really good application of how that works and how that plays into it. And you can see it. And again, remember, the architect takes part of the plan and chops it. And you see everything that happens in there. So you'll learn a little bit. You know, who knows? Maybe you'll become an architect and you can see it. And this shows all of the applications and everything fun and fabulous that can happen with that. Um, quick comments from the builder. We called it Quick Five. Something we wanted to remind you that a few of the builders we work with often say drainage, such a big deal plays into this whole pervious and pervious material. Know where your water is going from your lot. Is it going out the back? Is it going out the front? How is it draining? Do you need to bury some lines? Do you need to do an underground cistern to catch the water for you? Think about the drainage. It's a big deal. We talked about that pervious, impervious. Can't stress enough how important it is. Understand it. Talk to your community leaders, have an understanding about what those rules are going to be and be sure and follow them. Also consider the slope of your lot. If you have a really low prof profile car and that front, whatever it's called, spoiler, skirt, is really low to the ground and you have a steep hill going up or you go up and down or bumps, there's a, a major opportunity that that is going to scrape. So if you are looking at a lot or you're looking to build and it's on a slant, definitely consider that. Also, if you're looking to have a basement, slope is amazing to be able to have that and perfect because you can either walk out of the side, you can walk out of the back. It's called egress. You're able to have it. Sets itself up very nicely, a little bit less expensive when you have that slope to happen. So consider that in your plans. Next week, we are going to hopefully talk about our vendor walk. Vendor walk is where we meet with the vendors, uh, your plumber, your electrician, anyone that's doing anything on your project and go through everything that they're going to do in the house, answer any questions, give them any specifications that they have, specifically the, the plumber, specifically the electrician. Make sure there's no questions. Everybody has all the answers that they need. Really important part of the process, and we have to make sure that that happens and plans accordingly. Then we're also going to talk about framing. Framing is a huge aspect of building your house. It's what you see. Uh, it's one of the elements. Thankfully, wood prices are starting to come down a little bit. So you are able to um, hopefully save a few dollars that's on there. But we need to know what those details are going to be. So we're going to talk about that and a couple of other elements. Thank you all for watching number four and be sure and check out my podcast designers lane podcast.com subscribe. You can see all of the past podcasts that's happened and hopefully what's coming up in the future. And also I want to thank my sponsors, Dogwood and company luxury building and Cary, North Carolina, new construction and remodeling. And of course, we can't forget Jenny Blanton taking care of all of your real estate needs in Central North Carolina. That's going to be Cary, Raleigh, Durham, Sanford area. Give her a call if you have anything that you're listing or you need to buy. She's going to do a great job and take care of you. Thanks again for tuning in, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Have a great day.